Uh, Sharonik, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Sharonik. I'm sorry if my face is larger than life. Uh, I am a PhD student at NYU English. I study uh, economic thought and literature, and I am one half of High Theory, which is a podcast that Kim runs. And uh, Jimena, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Jimena. I'm an undergrad uh, studying biology and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. And I took a class with Dr. Adams and I came to learn about their research. Right. Hello. Introduce yourself. Hi, guys. I'm Bilal. I'm a first year anthropology PhD student. Uh, I'm also training as a physician. I'm really interested in anthropology as it can be understood through uh, histories of colonial violence, especially in Pakistan, uh, and how religion is. Great. Also, great to have every, to have so many people here to have this, this kind of new group of people in the in the winter quarter. And this is our first uh, first of three sessions in the winter quarter. And it is such a pleasure to have Kim with us tonight. So Kim, Kim Adams is one of us. She was here at the Humanities Center last year and she was a um, SELS Emerging Voice Fellow last in the Public Humanities, which is a cool organization on campus. Now she is in the, um, in the humanities in the world postdoctoral fellow at, at, at Penn. Mm -hmm. And she took her PhD at, at NYU with a, one of the best titled dissertations. Mm -hmm. It's called The Body Electric. Mm -hmm. And she's gonna talk to us about that uh, tonight. She identifies primarily as a medical humanities scholar and she, Already, you have four peer-reviewed publications. You have four pieces of public writing, and I, I now see a new way of how to organize the data, and that's kind of cool to separate the public writing from the peer-reviewed publications. She's a really good writer, and I expect her to be one of our medical humanities stars moving forward. And so we're really looking forward to hearing you and, I, and I'm gonna, just going to say that when I was talking with, with as I was talking with Kim just before and she's shitting and the book is is a it was a dissertation and it was spun in five different directions and it's emerging as a book and so I think you would be interested in hearing from us what really stands out and what what would make this a, what would make a book really look sharp what would what, what, what could we say to help you create the best possible book yeah that would be great thank you that was a wonderful very generous introduction um, and i definitely stole that title from you. Uh, okay so the title of today's talk is Perturbative Power, Electricity and Medicine from Mesmerism to Shock Therapy. Okay, um, so my research examines how narratives of technology have shaped US healthcare from mesmerism to modern medicine. And I often begin presentations like this with some of the more peculiar electric medical devices from the past, um, things like electric belts and fire rays. Um, small scale home cure devices that use the rhetoric of feeding the body with electricity to domesticate the threatening forces of electrical modernity. But today I'm going to start with those threatening forces themselves. So, at the turn of the 20th century, Henry Adams found himself on the floor of a public exhibition hall in Paris. Thus, it happened that after 10 years of pursuit, he found himself lying in the gallery of machines at the Great Exposition of 1900, his historical neck broken by the sudden eruption of forces totally. 
Adams, a 62-year-old Victorian gentleman, Harvard-educated historian from an elite political family, would probably not have actually laid on the floor. <laughs> um, but the force that knocked him off his epistemological rocker, shattering the relation of seeds that he sought and breaking his historical neck was electricity, specifically the dynamo. Um, and I should say before I go any further that there are access copies down there um, if you want to follow along on a printed copy. And there's also an online version that has there. Can I check just for a minute and ask that people take the clipboard, find your name, and just check it off or add it if it's not there? Thank you. Great. Okay. So. Um, right, so Henry Adams on the floor, um, the dynamo. <laughs> a dynamo is a generator. It's a machine for converting mechanical energy into electrical energy. Like our modern consumer electronic show, CES, the Paris Exposition of 1900 was designed to showcase a technological vision of the future. And the spectacle of electric light and motion was one of the key attractions, but so too were the machines that produced electricity. So while the coal-fired steam engines were hidden outside the exhibit in a dirty engine house, the dynamo was on display. Adams went to the Paris Exposition seeking to understand modernity, aching to absorb knowledge and help us define it. He describes his visit in a chapter from of the education of Henry Adams called The Virgin and the Dynamo, 1900. Sorry, please do that. It's The Dynamo and the Virgin. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that, that line I read, I started with about his historical neck being broken, is one of the most frequently quoted passages from the book, which is itself a classic of American studies. Um, and unlike most of the machines that I study, dynamos weren't actually meant to touch human bodies. But I've brought us here because of a really weird image that Adam uses, Adams uses to elucidate dynamos power. Okay, so at the exposition, Adams found that his usual methods for understanding history, art, and culture were thwarted haunted the fairgrounds, meditating chaos, until a helpful physicist who happened to be the secretary of the Smithsonian, Samuel Pierpoint Langley, showed up and showed him around. So Langley showed his scholar the great Hall dynamos, which he, Langley, took to be a means to an end, an ingenious channel for conveying heat. But the historian saw the dynamo in a decidedly metaphysical manner as a symbol of infinity and a moral force. The huge wheel outpaces the planet itself, revolving within an arm's length at some vertiginous speed and barely murmuring, scarcely humming an audible warning to stand a hair's breadth further for respect of power, while it would not wake the baby lying close against its frame. Beneficent and swift, silent and enormous, before the end, one began to pray to him. So I heard this passage read aloud recently at the Modern Language Association Convention, and the scholars citing it drew our attention to the silence, which highlights the vertiginous strangeness of Adam's reaction. The is the baby. Why does Adams imagine a human infant lying close against the frame of this? violently revolving machine. So the claim that the dynamo is silent is quite mad. 19th century machines wouldn't have happened. This if it works. Silence. <laughs> um, as much an idiom for creating silence as shh, you're in a library. Um, but I would argue that the baby's hotel, 
a clue to Adam Slider. I... After all, the title of the chapter is The Dynamo and the Furbies. And between them is where Adams locates his epistemological break. Before this historical chasm, a mind like that of Adams felt itself helpless. This is from his text. He turned from the virgin to the dynamo as though he were a brandly coherer. So a brandly coherer is a new technology for detecting radio waves that was on display at the exposition. And the problem of modernity comically turns Adams into one of his devices. But the virgin in question is the Virgin Mary, who he identifies with Venus as, quote, the highest energy ever known to man because of the art she created. And creator is his word, not mine. I would have said inspired. On the, on, so on this slide is the Golden Virgin at the Cathedral of Amiens, which he visits in the chapter. But the problem for Adams is that the Virgin belongs to the old world rather than the new. She exercised, quote, vastly more attraction for the human mind than all the steam engines and dynamos ever dreamed of. And yet this energy was unknown to the American mind. He writes, an American virgin would never dare man. An American Venus would never dare exist. So now I'm not so sure that Americans never felt the force of the virgin. After all, Adam's America is wealthy, patrician, and very Protestant. But I do think his urge to worship the dynamo in the place of the virgin tells us something about the ideological force of electricity in the United States. It aligns the productive power of industrial modernity with the reproductive power of the human body. So the virgin is the dynamo because of her fertility. She was goddess because of her force. She was the animated dynamo. She was reproduction, the greatest and most mysterious of all energies. All she needed to be was feet. And like he's pretty clear about this in the text. It's not the beauty of the virgin or Venus that's worshipped, but it is her ability to procreate. So my argument, in short, is that Americans have long understood electricity as a sexual energy, specifically associated with reproductive sex. This association functions on a metaphorical and a practical level. So not only is electricity depicted as a sexual energy in cultural texts, but it is used to treat reproductive ailments and control reproductive behaviors and medical practice. And this is how electric medicine ends up connected to things like race science. And so I will say in the spirit of the workshop that this is a new articulation of my main argument um, and the prior versions of more education and democracy, but I'm trying out this formulation here. And so I'm curious to hear what you guys think of it. Much of the scholarship on electricity as a cultural phenomenon centers communications technology. Media studies scholars and literary historians present the telegraph and the telephone as the primary mechanisms by which electricity reshaped American thinking. And this line of argument tends to lead to the personal computer and the internet as the telos of electrical modernity. Another pathway to the internet begins with devices that made new forms of aesthetic experience possible, the radio, gramophone, film projector, television, as modes of transforming individual and collective consciousness. Historical scholarships tends to focus on public infrastructure, streetlights and streetcars, and industrial machinery, there's dynamos, in the interest of arguments about class. Cultural studies work that considers race and technology comes much closer to my own interests in electricity in the body. So again, I'm interested in thinking about how electricity as one of the constitutive forces of modernity shapes US healthcare. What one finds 
very quickly when one starts to look at practices and devices that deposit electricity as a therapeutic agent, is a lot of discourse about sex. So my, my dissertation in my book starts with mesmerism, and mesmerists were often accused of sexual impropriety. Home cure devices like electric belts and vibrators were marketed as cures for impotence, and diseases commonly treated with electricity like shell shock and neurasthenia are strongly gendered in their treatment. This slide shows title pages from a pamphlet war in Boston in the 1970s. One on the left is a polemic against mesmerism, in which the writer confesses to have used animal magnetism to seduce vulnerable young women, and the one on the right denies that confession as folly and falsehood. And he is of mesmerism, um, but this war of moral probity assumes at baseline that mesmerism produced forms of bodies and that the magnetic fluid mesmerists manipulated was akin to other more visible bodily secretions. So when we turn to the right text, we can see the idea of electricity as a sexual energy raising quintessentially American desires and anxieties about race and reproduction. So, Back in that opening scene of Adams and the Paris Exposition, he identified Walt Whitman as, quote, the only American artist who has ever insisted on the power of sex. Um, yeah. uh, which, like, if you're reading 19th century American literature, is pretty spot on. Um, so this is the title page from the 1867 edition of Leaves of Grass. Um, and these are the open, opening lines by saying the body electric. Uh, which is the most canonical text on electricity of the body in American literature, and it's the one from which I stole the title of my dissertation. Um, it's also, so Whitman published Leaves of Grass in, I don't know how much, how much of this is common knowledge, but I'm just going to say it because I know everybody is not a literary scholar here. Whitman published Leaves of Grass in 1885 and revised it continually over his lifetime. Um, he didn't add this line about electricity until 1867 after the Civil War. And the poem itself appears in all of the editions, all six of the editions published during his lifetime. Um, and it contains a slave auction in every edition. Um, so this is the slave auction scene from the 1867 edition, um, which, as you know, is after the Civil War, a conflict in which the serve as a nurse. Um, and you can see that it begins in section seven, with the line, a man's body at auction. I don't know how much you can actually see, it's kind of small, but it'll be picked on the next screen. Um, and there's also a woman's body at auction in section eight. Um, earlier editions begin with a slave at auction, um, and later editions include the parenthetical note, before the war, I often go to the slave market and watch the sale. That's not until 1881, which is actually quite a while after the um, so women changes the line from slave to man, not because of the, the new freedom for Black people in America, but in order to establish a parity with the female body at the start, at the start of Section 8. Um, and that balance is actually a major concern of the poem as Whitman revises it over the conditions to match his idea of amative or reproductive love. So what I want to highlight is that Whitman values the enslaved body as his contemporaries do in terms of its reproductive capacity. So um, he writes, this is not only one man, this is the father of those who shall be fathers in their turn. She too is not only herself, she is the teeming mother of mothers. She is the bearer of them that shall grow to be mates to the mothers. So the US Congress banned the importation of slaves in 1808, ending America's participation in the international slave trade. But it did not end chattel slavery until 1865, with the passage of the 13th Amendment. This means that an entire industry dedicated to slave breeding grew up in the United States. And Deirdre Cooper Owen's work connects this industry to the origins of American anthropology. The linkage of enslavement and reproductive labor helps explain why the slave auction appears to be a price of the body electric. 
This poem is part of a sequence called The Children of Adam, which is addressed to the passion of woman or the amative love of woman, rather than the queer democratic force that he suggests, manly love, to which he dedicates calamus themes. It's another example of the poem. So adhesiveness and amativeness are terms that appear in a manuscript and they're terms that have been borrowed from the contemporary science of phrenology. Um, and if you guys have thoughts about phrenology, I hear them, but I just want to note that Whitman was drawing from the science of his day of, um, to understand electricity in the body, as well as drawing from the economic structures of his day in thinking about the enslaved body, right? Um, so I'll, I'll ask you guys now to turn your attention to the stanza that appears between the two images of valuable enslaved fertility. What we see here is a desire for a democratic union with the descendants of the With him, the start of populous states and republics. Alongside an anxiety that Americans have no clear need. How do you know who shall come from the offspring of his offspring through the centuries? Who might you find you have come from yourself if you can trace back through the centuries? So while Whitman perhaps intends these lines as rhetorical questions that would trouble his readers' own ideas of racial parity, his contemporaries would have read these lines as a question about miscegenation. And we know that miscegenation was a theme because he wrote a terrible newspaper novel about miscegenation before the book was suppressed. <laughs> so in our current moment, we tend to understand race as a visual scheme for sorting human beings, in which anyone's race can be read through the physical presentation of their body along the axes of specific, specific features deemed significant. But the idea of race that operates in the US in the 19th and early 20th centuries not only relies on a different visual calculus, but it is primarily about reproduction and inheritance, and only secondarily about the physical presentation. Hence the obsession with miscegenation. Um, and so I'll note here in passing that one of the characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin actually darkens his skin to facilitate his escape from slavery producing a, quote, dark Spanish complexion that hides the, quote, slight mulatto tone that he inherited from his mother. Um, and it is, in fact, in passing, these categories get negotiated as the passing fiction of the early 20th century demonstrates. Um, and one of my chapters is about the passing fiction, so I'm if you're interested. Um, but what you're looking at right now is a sketch of Whitman sunbathing naked. And I put it up here because I want us to think about how theories of race and technologies of the body in here in romantic idols that seem far from the tracks of modernity. Whitman depicts the body electric as sex that attracts with a fierce, undeniable attraction. So what are the other lines from the poem? It's pretty great. I'll read it again. It attracts with a fierce, undeniable attraction. Um, as the, the sexy electric body is endowed with a that carries the legacy of enslavement into the future of the nation, a depiction that reflects science, but also helps shape how Americans understand and use electricity. So that's the end of my, uh, you're not going to get any more poetry or any more close reading. <laughs> um, that's the end of my literary scholar book. Um, my research focuses less on practices of racial representation and more on scientific and social theories that present race as a cause and consequence of human reproductive behavior. The most powerful of these theories in the historical moment that I study, and arguably our own, is eugenics. And the reason that eugenics is such a powerful force of modernity is its ability to negotiate between the individual and the collective to make one's own reproductive behavior matter on the scale of the nation. This is an argument that I'm taking from the work of David English, from whose book I have also borrowed this image of an educational display that uses the spectacle of electric light to represent the 
proliferation of disjunct images. So what this thing would do, I know it's kind of hard to read, um, but this um, says, some people are born to be a burden to the rest. Learn about heredity and you can help correct these conditions. And this light flashes every 18 seconds. Every 18 seconds, a person is born in the United States that will never grow beyond the age of a normal eight-year-old boy or girl, right? So um, the, the lights are supposed to flash every time someone who should not have been born is born, basically. Okay, so this is the spectacle of electricity in a sort of educational display. Um, it would have been at like state fairs. Are we okay on the technology? Uh, the technology uh, <laughs> is not very happy with the electricity conversation, but I would like you to yeah. switch seats with Serena if that's okay. Okay. Uh, sure. I'm sorry for the interruption, but a lot of people are complaining about um, the voice breaking. Okay. Uh, and I think this should help us. Okay. Yeah. Serena. That's the mic is up there. Okay. Um, Change right. with Maria. Yeah, we should be in this spot, but let's yeah. test it. Why don't you go ahead and just test it a bit and ask people to respond online. Okay. All right, so I will uh, valiantly carry on. <laughs> um, uh, so one of the tasks of my argument is to convince you that the coercive reproductive practices in the United States from anti-miscegenation laws and eugenic sterilizations to abortion bans and anti-trans politics are deeply invested in a technologized vision of the human body that understands electricity as a sexual energy and human flourishing as racial progress. And I would wager that it's through sex that electricity gets linked to human flourishing and race tends to drop out of the equation as something we can no longer say, but that doesn't mean it's not there. So now that I've said all these things, I'm gonna give you guys an example of a cultural representation of medical technology that demonstrates the linkage between sex and electricity. And I'm happy to talk more about the other technologies I study and scientific theories that define race in terms of reproduction, if you guys are interested. And then at the end, if we have time, I'll read a thing about how I came to this research um, and what I hope its impact will be in the world. How are we doing on the second? Yes. Better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Okay, um, so electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, is probably the best example we have of the reciprocal relations between medicine and culture. Um, so in the book, I write about the appearance of this technology in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and Sylvia Platt's The Bell Jar. ECT is developed on the eve of the Second World War by Italian psychiatrists seeking a new way to perform shock treatment. So the shock in the older name of electroshock therapy doesn't actually refer to an electric shock, um, but to the state of bodily shock in the sense of toxic shock syndrome or shell shock. Um, and it belongs to the broader field of biological psychiatry, which included psychosurgery and from which we get our modern pharmacopoeia of antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-anxiety medications. In both novels, ECT appears in relation to other practices of biopsychiatry. So it's one of two shock treatments that the Platt character, Esther Greenwood, gets in the bell jar, the other being insulin shock therapy. And it's clear, particularly from the depiction of insulin therapy, that the function of these treatments is to reinscribe wayward white women into their reproductive roles in post-war domesticity. So think Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique um, for the standard feminist reading that misses the element of race. Um, in Ellison's novel, we see the flip side of this um, coercive reproductive logic when castration is offered as an alternative to ECT to control the rebellious behavior of the young black narrator. Um, and surgical sterilization was actually used in mental hospitals at the time, according to eugenic and biologically based psychiatric logic to control reproductive and social behavior. 
But the most famous depiction of ECT in American culture appears in Milo Forman's 1975 film version of Ken Kesey's 1962 novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I think you can see a pretty clear impact of this film on prescribing practices in the United States. Um, I don't actually have the numbers for that, um, but I, we can talk about why I think that. Um, but it's worth noting that the bell jar is set in the 1950s when ECT, and when ECT appears in that text, it's an expensive outpatient treatment that the Platt character is worried is going to bankrupt her mother. Um, and that stands in really marked contrast to the narrative of ECT as punishment that we get in Kesey's text and Forman's film. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is play you guys a couple clips from the film if we have enough time. Um, and um, so I'm gonna show you the ECT scene and two scenes that frame it diegetically. And I will say that they're not the easiest scenes to watch, um, but, but that's kind of the point. Right? Um, so I don't know if you feel like you don't want to watch grown men um, throwing a tantrum. You can get that. Okay. Um, so this is, the, this is the first scene in the narrative sequence. Um, and it's one of the other psychiatric inmates. Um, you'll see. No! Come on. 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 That's the first one. And then um, this is the second one. In between these two scenes, um, the two characters who are sitting on the bench there um, sort of have a bonding moment. We can talk about that if you're interested. Um, but this is the ECT scene itself. So here's the end of the bonding moment. No many chief. Take a cigarette break, boys. Easy. I'll be fine. You do it. Ah. Would you sit up, please? Sure. <clears throat> Love to. Oh, boy. There uh, might be a little fluid in them boots, you know what I mean, boys? <laughs> a little leak. Light shine, boys. And Send the specimen to Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> All right, out with your gum. Huh? Out with your gum. Uh, okay, this won't hurt. It'll be over in just a moment. Uh huh. What's that? Conductant. A little dab will do you. Right, Mr. Jackson. Open your mouth. What's that? This will keep you from biting your tongue. Uh -oh. Now just bite down on it. That's right. Just bite down. Huh? Now bite down oh, on good. it. Good. <coughs> Are you ready? Last clip I'll show. So this is the um, this is the scene that occurs after it in the narrative. Um, 
How, how, how's it going, 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 Mac? Perfect, Billy boy, absolutely perfect. They uh, was giving me 10,000 watts a day, you know, and I'm hot to trot. Next woman takes me on is going to light up like a pinball machine and pay off in silver dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an amusing thought, Randall, Thank but you. when you came in, we were talking to Jim. So I know those are kind of a lot, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on these scenes. Um, I think the freak out, and the reason I showed you that first clip is because I think it's what frames the treatment as punishment. Um, and that helps us understand McMurphy's cavalier attitude when he walks in the treatment room as rebellion, um, and also helps us notice his flinch. Um, and the thing I noticed this time, which I hadn't noticed in past viewings, was the line that he says when they're about to take off his boots, there might be some fluid in those boots. I think that's implying that he pissed himself in that moment, right? Um, so, um, so that's the sort of framing that it gets. Um, and talk about the performance of the seizure and what you guys think of that. Um, but obviously, and I showed you the second clip, what I'm most interested in is what he says when he returns, right? So he says he's hot to trot. The next woman who takes me on is going to light up like a pinball machine and pay out in silver dollars. Um, so he's making light of the treatment here, right? He's trying to like appeal to the sort of the group um, dynamic and like insist on his manliness, his um, masculine power. Um, and so not only is he aroused by the treatment? That's what hot to trot means. But his next female partner is going to receive that sexual energy. She's going to light up like a pinball machine. And then she's going to produce a reward, right? She's going to pay out in silver dollars. Um, so the bravado of McMurphy's claim points us right back to where we started with electric modernity as a cure-all for waning masculinity. And these are some electric belt ads which um, very clearly, um, and other scholars have analyzed this, um, depict electricity as um, something that's going to improve masculine sexuality. And it's often um, implicitly a treatment for um, diseases that people thought were caused by masturbation. Um, so um, this is kind of where I'm gonna end us um do we have do we have time for one more thing okay so do you guys do you guys want to stop here and discuss or do you guys want to hear me just say a little bit about um how i came to this project okay okay because the linkages are kind of like i wouldn't necessarily have thought that although like yeah there's a lot going on so it'd be, it'd be that was one of my first thoughts before you sort of okay cool um so I'm going to read this thing um, that maybe address, hopefully answers those questions, but if it doesn't, I can talk more about it. Um, so I began this project by thinking about electricity in an ecological sense. So I wanted to think about solar panels, distributed generation, reducing energy consumption. Um, if one could sort out the intimate connections between electricity, the body, literature, and culture, I thought one could learn how to wean Americans off the grid in the face of the impending ecological crisis of climate change. Yet my research taught me that electricity is a deeply connected political entity, one that is bound up in our daily lives and social systems. So electricity use cannot and will not change alone. Electricity is embedded as an embodied force in the major social movements of the 20th century, civil rights, women's liberation, LGBTQ plus rights, and in the key terms of American political discourse, socialism, capitalism, and democracy. It belongs to domestic and foreign conflicts from the Civil War to the Cold War and belongs equally to the new left and old, the counterculture and the mainstream, the American Renaissance and the Harlem Renaissance, canonical novels, avant-garde poetry, Fiction. The union of electricity and progress is not a stable one, but it is a powerful trope that has structured the lived experience of American modernity. 
one of the systems that built systemic inequality over the course of the long 20th century is the electrical grid. Instrumentalizing this research towards an ecological end depends on a structural change that may exceed the ground of current political possibility. Anything like social, political, and economic equality for all bodies would both demand and produce a renegotiated relationship with electricity. So an unexpected outcome of my research is to suggest that the potential agency of medical discourse is to suggest the potential agency of medical discourse in changing our conversation about energy use. Medicine is a determining force in the historical relationship between electricity and the human body, and it can help us renegotiate that relationship towards a different understanding of electricity's role in our daily lives. Healthcare is a system for thinking about human bodies and full healthcare reform, meaning equal access to medical services that would treat all bodies with equal care and respect would entail wrestling with climate change and building a mechanism for the global redistribution of electric power. But medicine can help us on a metaphorical level as well. Reading electrical modernity through literature and medicine suggests that it is not only possible, but desirable to disentangle the good life from the electrical life. That's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
that's working and as well as like a real economics, right? So one of the reasons that um, ECT um, looks less appealing in 75 than in 55 um, is because of the economics of it, because it moves from an expensive outpatient treatment to something that's in state-run mental institutions, right? Um, so like there's a state institution in the, in the Plath novel as well, but ECT isn't available there because it's still a sort of a fancy new technology, right? But by the time he sees writing um, in the 60s, like it, it looks, it looks cheaper and it looks like it has the potential to be abused in that way. That's actually the core. Yeah. I hear you speak. So, so thinking as, a, as, as an editor of your, of your book, um, I think, what, I think what, re, what really comes through well is electricity is life force. And that is kind of resonates with libido it resonates with a lot, it resonates with sexuality, but there's a lot of talk in the United States, in, you know, like the nerve, nerve force, the life force, that kind of, that electric, electricity just seems like the natural model. Um, I think then the, uh, the pieces of the project are more like chapters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the reproduction thing for me, it, at least in the current telling, that seems, like in the race thing, it, those seem like chapters um, I, I, rather than this kind of major story about electricity as life force, sexuality, which has good, has to be honest, which is a, a positive aspects of it's spun, the metaphor is spun positive, and the metaphor is spun negative. Um, so I would carve away a lot of stuff. So, so right now, the um, you know, Whitman and the end of Ken Kesey is not enough to carry the metaphor. And so you really, you, you really need to, to kind of have this. So I think life force carries the metaphor more powerfully. And then as electricity does different work, it seems to have different kinds of pieces for you. I'd be a little worried. So I, I, I would soft pet a little bit the history of psychiatry that you're giving, just because I, I think that um, the other piece of the story that doesn't appear is the history of pharma pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And so I actually suspect that the movie doesn't have an impact on prescribing patterns. I suspect that the availability of these new medications has the, has the impact. And so, because the you know, there's nothing to treat. And chlorpromazine is like 52, 54. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the 70s, you get lithium for the first time, and you start to get some of the um, some of the tranquil some of the major tranquilizers. And so, there's I mean, that's the big shift in 75. It's the shift from psychoanalysis to biomedical psychiatry, and you don't want to be vulnerable to that critique. And you don't want to be vulnerable to, you know, electroshock therapy is pretty disconcerting, but it also kind of works for some people. And you don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to make claims yeah. that you don't need in order to make this great argument about the way in which electricity becomes this metaphor for the life force of the body, and then it all does different things. Yeah. So I think it's a really, it's a really cool project. I would just pare away some of the extra claims. Yeah, okay, no, fair. Um, I, so I, as you noticed, I hedged that claim because I was um, worried and I was hoping someone who knew more about the history of psychiatry could come and tell me. Um, uh, yeah, because, um, so, so I, I do think the, the, the thing that the, um, the, the text, the, that the film in particular does is it um, makes us see ECT as disconcerting. Yes, yes. In ways that I think it wasn't seen necessarily before. Like, the idea of shocking the body with electricity, it actually, it, like, it was done in many different ways before this moment, right? Um, not always in the same way, like not in the same place, like often it was um, much more localized. So when people had um, 
like neuralgias mm -hmm. or like other so other like psychosomatic complaints um but like so like um when shell shocked soldiers would speak mm -hmm. um there would be an e electrical stimulus applied to their tongue right right so it's it's much like it's more local or like when they could walk it would be applied to their legs so it's a different idea of how electricity might affect the body but it has a pretty long history in psychiatry it's still, it's still the underlying premise that it's the life force every one of those examples you gave it's an attempt you can almost think of it as it's an attempt to convey the life force to the the damaged um, part of the body totally totally um, I'm afraid it sounds like Star Wars when we start talking about the force. Um, but neurasthenia was all about almost the electrical sort of story of the body, that these nerves that were not doing their job. And somehow then that, you know, that some of that, all the, then the metaphors begin to, to change as for all sorts, for, for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Interesting, uh, the life force, the sexuality. I mean, that's an arresting metaphor. That's that's kind of cool. I'm very curious um, when they talk about the uh, applying it to the applying electricity to the body. Um, I'm gonna ask what came first, something like a um, ECT or electrocution as capital punishment? Oh, electrocution, much much older. Yeah, um, electrocution dates back. To the uh, 1890s, I right. think. But that's where it's the it's the ult it's the ultimate use of electricity yeah. as punishment, yeah. and then you you're sort of backing off and trying to find ways where you can use it to do some good, but but it's already demonstrated it's a very powerful punishment. It's even if you're using it for good, it is punishing. Yeah. Also, that it's like sexual force in a way. There's this ambivalence also in psychiatry when they think about sexual force. Yeah. Uh, life force and the, and the death, uh, Eros and Thanatos kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe the reason I think the life force is, sex, is a sexual force is just because I read too much Freud. <laughs> but it is, you're right, that that's there in the history of psychiatry as well, that like um, the libido might be that threat as well as life giving, right? And libido is not actually, well, anyway, not actually sexual entirely. So it, it gets translated in English as very sexual, but libido is much, much, much more like a kind of power in the body. Valentina mm -hmm. has a question and then maybe I'll go. Uh, Valentina, do you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, thank you. Let me lower my hand. Um, congrats on this presentation. I was just writing today about, um, <laughs> weirdly enough, about the uh, uh, Freud and uh, the American nervousness. I'm not sure if you uh, ran into that. So I was I, I had two ideas for you. I've been also <laughs> looking at neurasthenia, um, and one is that you definitely if if the if the if the overarching narrative is life force then definitely go into what it meant uh, and I'm so, I'm sorry if you're doing this already but this idea of life meaning a balance between all the organs and that kind of jump from the biological idea of life uh and disease being the opposite of life, that jump into the psyche, right? So um, there might be some way that you can link this electricity, not only as the libido, but as this way that somewhere in the history of psychiatry, uh, in the history of, of medicine, including Freud, but not only Freud, that do this weird jump between what was going on in the body as we knew it and the opposites as disease and what was going on in the psyche. And since I've been reading so much about how that was basically made through a lot of symptoms, right? Like 
if you read the, the, the long list of symptoms of what became anxiety, a lot of them have to do with the body. A lot of them have to do with fear of something. A lot of them are gendered. A lot of them, like, maybe if you go into these like convoluted uh, relations between the dimensions of what life is and how life was thought of in these areas, it, it, electricity might do something for you metaphorically too. Totally. Yeah. Um, so you raised a really good point, which I didn't address at all here, um, but was like a major thing that I was thinking about in the dissertation and perhaps should come back, um, is the uh, this idea um, that um, particularly preoccupies people in the 19th century that electricity, um, it's invisible um, and it might be the thing that mediates between body and soul. So electricity gets like weirdly wrapped into philosophical debates about monism and dualism. The idea like that um, either everything is made of one substance and we just are our bodies or the idea that we have a body and soul and electricity is supposed to be the thing that sort of bridges the gap. Um, and so this is why people like try to telegraph the dead basically because they think that electricity um, might be something that um, would like leap over that boundary between the corporeal and the psychic or um yeah or the spiritual yeah so um thank you that is really helpful and i i'm but the thing is like i don't quite know how to get that idea out of its historical moment and like if it tracks basically if it tracks through to the later text but maybe thinking about it specifically in terms of the history of psychiatry um, might be helpful there. Right. I, in, I, I think maybe one of the narrative threats can be symptoms and what that meant in the broader history of psychiatry, because that's how it comes into the, the, um, all the manuals and all the like Bibles that are being used, um, kind of like to make pharmaceuticals what, what deal with this kind of life, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe that could be a way. We have two questions in the chat. Uh, oh, so sorry. Yes, you should go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say I was I uh, really captivated by the like uh, reproduction link between like things of the virgin and the dynamo. The human body is this like there's this sort of like mythical quality to electricity, and I was just thinking about the connection of like like increasingly developed countries and like birth rates like as you get more and more electricity you need less and less of the reproduction of the like that's like projecting forward yeah i mean that's a it's a great point right because it um brings back brings me back to something that i think is pretty important to me and is kind of why i came to focus on the reproduction stuff for this talk um but also like in the broader project. So um, the stuff about eugenics, um, I think is a like key argument, like it's a key point of what I'm trying to say um, is that like this stuff about electricity in the body, um, it, I mean, kind of everything in the early 20th century is connected to eugenics, like it's inescapable, it's everywhere. Like, it, like everyone thinks, how are we going to build a better society? Oh, I know, we'll do it by controlling human breeding. That'll be great. This is what's going to make us modern, right? Um, and, um, you know, I, I've actually been reading some work that suggests that this is a thing that's much, much older, um, uh, that like, even though, um, like, uh, it's the, the like, claim that the Victorians made and that like, we have inherited from them is that it starts in 1880. Um, with Darwin's cousin, um, his name has escaped me right now. Um, Galton? Yes, Galton. Um, he's the one who invents the word eugenics, um, but like, um, you know, it's pretty clear that people had ideas like this before and that they had practices like this. If you look at basically any utopian fiction, um, or if you look at like Renaissance horse breeding. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but um, getting back to what you were saying, um, so 
uh, degeneration discourse is a huge thing around the turn of the 20th century. It's related to these ideas of neurasthenia um, and like it's it's a depopulation anxiety basically it's like the idea is that um, the quality of the race is degrading um, and the race arguably means the human race the American race or the white race um, or the black race like whoever you're talking to will like claim it for themselves basically um, and um, and that like um, our national stock is declining it's often articulated in, in um, nationalist terms and and that um like so and and that's specifically in in someone like beard george miller beard um american nervousness um really specifically articulated to modernity um and to like civilization and progress so and and the education of women bad you don't want to educate women because <laughs> um, then they won't make more babies um so so like um I think part, part, part of the problem is that I'm way more fascinated by this like race science stuff. Um, but I, I do actually think it is connected to electricity as like um, an actual phenomenon that helps make modernity as you're suggesting um, and as a metaphorical phenomenon. Yeah. We, uh, uh, Audrey, would you like to read this comment? It's, I think, super interesting, and um, people in the room uh, would love to hear it. Um, okay, sure. Um, so basically, I was commenting um, as an anesthesiologist um, and also a human being that I feel the brutality in that scene that you showed um is the lack of anesthesia and i mean i don't know everything about cuckoo's nest i think it's from the, depicts something in the 1950s when perhaps anesthesia was very selectively given um for the procedure and there ha there is a history with anesthesia since um since first successful public demonstration in the mid 1800s that it sometimes is given selectively um, or it's felt that the patient should be feeling pain and pain medication analgesia is withheld. So it's an ongoing issue, but for me, the brutality is the lack of anesthesia. Um, and increases the amount of the punishment that the procedure itself um, is being used for. Um, and that sort of ironically what anesthetics do um, is alter the brain waves, the brain's electricity um, to enable unconsciousness. And there are certain anesthetics that change the seizure threshold and are not good for ECT. Anyway, I just, um, to me, it felt um, incomplete to avoid talking about anesthesia and um, I don't know, there are just so many ways that electricity is um, monitored uh, via the EKG or things like that, that might also play into the life force and sort of the, de the, the calling of a death um, and the difference between brain death and cardiac death, um, which I think would also be kind of interesting, um, but perhaps is going beyond the time frame that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, the stuff about brain death and cardiac death is like super interesting because it's it's one of the things that like produces the discipline of medical ethics in a way, right? Uh, and abortion. Like it's um, the like determining um, determining when you take someone off the ventilator is, is part of the um, what ethics, how ethics comes into the hospital. 
Um, but um, that's sort of neither here nor there. Um, the, um, and I, I'd actually be curious to hear what those in the room, as well as um, Audrey and other folks on Zoom, think about this. Um, uh, so I don't really talk uh, so much about um, electric diagnostic and monitoring technology, um, which is a whole thing in the history of medicine. Um, there are a lot of things like the EKG, um, electroencephalogram, um, and they, they all have a history that's related um, quite closely to the electric treatment stuff um, um, and is super important for the role of electricity in medicine, but it's kind of really hard to be comprehensive in that way, right? I would think small. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of big topics there. Yeah. I, mean, I love the eugenic stuff, but it's not totally clear to me that it's about electricity. Mm -hmm. I would stick to your focus and barrel through, but yeah. that would be me. Sure. sure. Um, yeah. So, well, okay. So, um, but that said, like, um, you know, the like, one of the ways that anesthesia works now and like one of the things that makes it safe is that we can monitor the body right um and we use electricity to do that we use the body's electricity to do that right and reading the body's electricity um ideas of like reading the body as well as writing the body are like super important about electricity in the body um yeah i know I'm, I'm not really the moderator but uh alan uh, you have had your hand digital hand up for some while Uh, you don't unmute, please. Right, sorry. Uh, after all these years of Zoom, I still forget. Um, <laughs> but thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Kim, for your presentation. And as a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist, I uh, I always uh, enjoy hearing the humanities perspective. That's very illuminating for me. Um, but I, I did also want to piggyback onto Audrey's comment. Um, so I really have two things to say, but the first one's just that, um, you know, currently electric convulsive therapy uh, is done under anesthesia, uh, often in a sort of like operating room setting. And uh, anesthesiologists and a psychiatrist are generally uh, present. Uh, and then with anesthesia, uh, the, the patient is really not conscious of the seizure and with various drugs that uh, eliminate muscle movement, uh, you don't see the tonic-clonic movements of generalized seizures that, that uh, the public are usually aware of. So um, we, we now actually show a video of current day electroconvulsive therapy to all the medical students uh, I think sometimes patients are also so shown these too before they receive ECT. So fortunately, it is not um, the same procedure that it was in the uh, foo foo uh, in the Kukos Ness um, movie. But my my second comment uh, is uh, I was very interested in you know Tanya talking about formulating this as sort of electricity as a life force and. And certainly it's literally a life force when we shock people's hearts uh, during cardiac arrest. And I think as portrayed in movies, this is a heroic measure, even though it is rather gruesome to see someone's body sort of, you know, rise off the table when they get shocked. Um, but uh, I, as a, you know, I think in psychiatry and as neuroscientists, generally just think that uh, electricity is energy, and energy can, like science, can be used for good or for bad. Um, and certainly there are all these different ways we can think of it as life force, but I think, um, you know, the other comment pointed out, and i sorry, I didn't catch the name of the, um, the, the person who mentioned this about, you know, electrocution and the electric chair, uh, and also the use of electricity as um, uh, various ways of punishment. I'm afraid even uh, in psychiatry, the use of shocking uh, people in a behavioral paradigm to punish them for 
various thoughts, uh, even you know homosexual uh, types of fantasies being shocked and so on. So it's really a form of energy and, and it all depends on the dose you use. You know, if you use too much, that certainly is not life, it's in someone's life. Um, you know, how you deliver that dose, uh, what context you do it. Um, and we're seeing, you know, recurrence of, of thinking about bring, using very low doses of electricity. Um, so it's not so dangerous. Um, I don't know if they will be of value, but more and more in uh, medicine, we're seeing sort of more micro uses of electricity. Um, so anyway, I hope that might be of interest. Totally, totally. And this, it sounds, uh, maybe I'm definitely saying this, but it sounds like what people say about taking drugs, right? Dose, set, and setting. Mm -hmm. Like it's all about like how much um, and like the environment, right? And that that's like something that comes, I think, out of the history of psychiatry, as you're saying, um, but the history of medicine more broadly. Um, okay, so, but I don't, I, I, I don't want to lose track of this thing about anesthesia from Audrey's question that was at the beginning of um, Alan's, um, because the thing that Audrey said that was super useful um, was um, there is a history of anesthesia being given um, in terms of like um, how we judge like um, who should feel what, right? And what um, pain is appropriate to take away and what pain is it. Um, and so like the, the, I think the plastic example and maybe Audrey was referring to this um, is there was a, a debate in the 19th century about whether women should receive anesthesia while giving birth. And the fear, the thought was that women wouldn't love their babies if they didn't have pain in giving birth to them, that somehow that pain was linked to the law. Um, and so th there's a real question about what the sort of purpose of pain is there and what its like value is um, culturally and psychologically. Um, and, but so, um, I didn't show you guys that scene. It's kind of impossible to show someone that scene from um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest um, without um, provoking uh, thoughts about the like actual treatment. Sorry, that's not quite what I mean. I, I did show you that scene to be like, ECT is bad, we shouldn't do it. Um, because like the point, that I wanted to make is that that video, that um, you know, narrative, filmic depiction of a specific psychiatric technology that uses electricity is like powerful in that way, that it evokes that response from us, that it makes us want to say, ECT is bad, right? Like that it, that it has that sort of effect on people um, and that it very, very different from other cultural depictions of ECT that we can see in other texts, right? That don't present it in the same light, that don't present it as having that visceral response, right? And I think Alan's comment pointed us to that because what he said is that there's actually a video of how ECT is performed now that is shown to medical students and patients, right? So it's it's using that same technology of film um, in order to convey a different understanding of what this treatment might be like, right? Um, and so all of, like both of those are sort of like um, narrative or like, um, textual or whatever, filmic representations of uh, actual literal practice, right? Um, and so I want us to think about how those representations affect the practice, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Back to, back to Tanya's point about, you know, you kind of have to think small or focused yeah. instead of all encompassing. 
Um, <laughs> you have a lot of passion around a lot of different themes and threads. Yeah. But, um, you know, I started thinking, okay, we've been talking life force. Life force definitely does seem to work with the positive, the negative, and can take you in a lot of different um, directions. Um, and you can segment it that, but I'm thinking back to when you, when we first started this conversation and you had a strong and somewhat passionate view about ecology. Mm -hmm. So the question I have for you is, how do you balance life force, ecology? What are you using? You know, at some point, I think you are probably going to have to winnow and pick a um, pick an anchor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to quickly interrupt because there is a question from Dora, which we time she's facing some computer issues. So I'm going to read it out, and then there's a comment by Valentina that also I'm going to read out to save time. You had a question, and Tanya yeah. wanted to say something as well. And Purnima, yeah. okay, Laura's question. Uh, question, but only if there is time. Is is part of the narrative uh, the question who controls electricity and life force? I'm thinking of Marinetti's play Electricity. As a futurist, he should be celebrating the electrical dolls that are the protagonists. But in actuality, he needs the work. Uh, he needs the work. No, needs to work with the mad sexual and anti-sentimental uh, energy of their creator, who is human but can control the uncontrollable force of electricity. Uh, that's Laura's question. Uh, and then Valentina has a comment uh, which says, a small idea, lightning is always used as the example to talk about the fear of dying. Maybe that is a fun way to link ideas of life and psyche. Um, and she is affirming the idea to, if you take the idea of electricity as life force, then that is another aspect of it, preserving, quantifying, and monitoring life. I think that's when you were talking about that. Uh, that, that was about including or not including EHGs. I say yes. Because no. it's in Tanya's overarching theme. <laughs> you want to take the other yeah. questions as well? I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to mention, going back to the idea of electricity as a life force, and also what you were discussing with Valentina about uh, the jump from experiencing it in the body to the psyche. I think I, I was thinking of Dirk Heim and how he describes in elementary forms of religion the experience of being empowered, equates that the real force that you've experienced to electricity. And I think for a lot of mana moment thinkers, electricity sort of offered that language of explaining a mystical phenomena, but also qualifying it as this is a real thing and it has the force yeah. of light electricity. So using electricity as a metaphor. And I think there's some writing around exploring this connection between metaphor, between like religion, uh, electricity specifically in Dirk Heim, but if I think someone's written about that. So, in yeah. case that's useful. So, yeah. useful. that's a really good, good yeah. um, suggestion. I think Leo Coleman is an anthropologist who's written about this. So. Um, cool. Yeah. And, you know, like the other thing is crowds are right, are, are the signifier of modernity in the city, right? Like, you know, Benny Mead, their good project, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, Suggestion. Yeah, let's again let's have a question. Um just and sorry if I'm just gonna like name the obvious. Um, um but one of the things that I was thinking that might make uh, uh bringing these disparate um um as it were case studies or examples just a little bit more clear. And again, forgive me if this is just like really dude. Um, but you know, so uh, electricity is a life force. Um, one of the quotes that probably we're all tired of hearing. Um, I don't remember from which lecture, but like the definition, one of the one of the glosses that we're quoting in biopolitics is make, live, and let die. Um, and because part of the talk concerns this issue of uh, uh, electricity, uh, 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 race science, reproduction, um, eugenics, uh, make, live, let die, um, the let die of it, I think one of the things that Professor Lerman said earlier when you responded to this, the woman in blue, you said that electricity, <laughs> my bad, sorry, uh, electricity has both a, a me uh, metaphorical but also a practical relationship to play. I I just didn't. I'm like, is this over my head? I didn't I didn't hear the I didn't feel the practical. Um, I just didn't get that piece of it. How it's practically electricity is practically uh, no to um, 
um, eugenics, race science. I just like, and again, I don't know if that's like, it was just like way over my head. Um, the other thing was really just the only thing I wanted, I didn't, I didn't mean to say all this. The only thing I really wanted to say were the two things that I found most compelling were there was something you made, it was lots, it was like a, it was like a semicolon sentence. And I was like, oh wait, no, stop. Um, uh, back in the day, race was a visual, um, visual means by which human beings uh, categorize difference, um, which then um, obviously has relationships to eugenics, et cetera. You said something along the lines of, it's still present even though we don't talk about it that way or something like that. I tried to write down what you said. It's like obviously still present, right? Hell yeah, super interesting. Yeah. Like I was like, yes, say more about that. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that was also extremely provocative was um, something about the feasibility of, uh, the, the, is it feasible to create a, a, you know, like a fair world? Okay. And you were, you were suggesting that it isn't. And again, I was like, hell yeah, write about that. You know, like, and where does that leave us, right? Like, where does that leave us? Like, if, when, when, when we start to contend with the fact that some of these, like, uh, uh, desires of the Enlightenment are not feasible, then what? Yeah. Then what? Yeah, and I think what I hear and what you're saying is that I do actually need to engage with Foucault. No, 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 do not. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. Okay, because this came up no. in my dissertation for like, no. like, <laughs> no. Okay, okay. We'll ruin it. Okay. Okay. No. But like, maybe you don't have to use that quote, but like some variation of that, like as, as you know, like they're, they're co, like uh, codependent processes, like you make live and you necessarily make die, okay. that kind of thing. Okay. But like, no. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, no. The most played out figure in the, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, all right, cool. I will, I will avoid <laughs> um, So instead, I'm going to answer Laura's question. Yeah, of course, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. You, thank you so much for like highlighting those specific sections um, and for bringing me back to Foucault, whether or not I go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so Laura's comment about the Marinetti play, Electricity, um, reminds me of this other crazy thing that didn't make it into the dissertation for the book at all, but I think you guys should all know about it, um, which is that Gertrude Stein wrote a revision of Faust um, in which the thing that Faust invents, the thing, like, the thing that he gets from the devil is the ability to invent electric light. That goes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's truly mad. Um, it's just, it's, it's truly mad. Uh, there's a viper, uh, there's someone who, yeah, yeah. The, uh, there's a lot, there's someone who has four names, um, but, um, but yeah, so I, I think that there is, there is really, there's a modernist thing that um, probably uh, Marinetti is dealing with too, um, in thinking about let's see this way, and, and its relation um, back to religion, right, um, and back to death. Um, and the idea of a career. I mean, I've also been told um, that I ought to engage with um, Frankenstein, um, which I'm definitely not going to do because it's a project about America. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. um, were there other thoughts, other comments, things I have failed to address? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I, do, I really, I mean, great presentation. Sorry for the interruptions. I would blame electricity for it. Uh, yes. <laughs> on us. Yeah. But um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the bonding scene uh, okay. and if there are literary traces of precisely the point that you made about pain and, and, and uh, mission as to what kinds of sociality does pain engender. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think electricity slash life force is perhaps that one uh, instance in medicine where we do see histories of queerness, disability, and delinquency tied together very neatly, um, which are identities which are being forcefully thought to thought today together. But I think your you know your 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 project is giving us a foray into where they actually were together in, in institutional life, which I found super interesting and if. There are more instances of, you know, uh, sociality in institution vis-a-vis -vis the fear of electricity. Uh, that would be super interesting to maybe explore. 
Totally, totally. And um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest is nothing if not about homosocial bonding. Mm -hmm. Like it's all about male sociality. Um, and um, almost in a, like um, a sort of like in the film in particular in a, in a classic way in relation to women as the third party. So like in, in the like uh, Sedwick between men kind of thing um, where there's like, um, there's like a girl who's brought in um, and like she's like supposed to be McMurphy's date, but then he like gives her to one of the other mm -hmm. men in the institution in order to like initiate him into the group kind of thing. Um, uh, so, um, so, so yes, it, there's a lot of stuff about male bonding. Um, the bonding scene that I didn't show you guys in between those two scenes um, is not really about fear of the treatment. Um, it's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more racist um, because that character, the other character he's sitting next to um, is a Native American character who's actually the narrator in Kesey's novel. Um, and um, the, the like standard reading of that novel is that it's a novel about freedom in America. And the like big set piece, the big thing that happens is that character breaks out of the mental institution by picking up this really heavy um, fixture in the bathroom and throwing it through a window. Um, and that he was like taught to do that. He was restored in his masculinity by um, the, um, the character, the um, McMurphy character um, who comes in and sort of like changes the dynamic of the institution. Um, and, and it's a really um, sexist novel. Like the, the, the main argument is that it, that space is controlled by Nurse Ratchet, the woman that we saw speaking at the very end, um, and that she produces an emasculating environment, right? Um, but um, yeah, basically in that scene, um, Mick Murphy figures out that the um, Native American character who's called Chief can talk even though he's um, been pretending the entire time that he can. Yeah. On that cheerful note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. Great discussion. That was Thank fun. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.